All right, we're back. We're working with uh, hypothesis testing for variances. Hope you guys are well. Uh, we just did one variance. Uh, now we're going to do a hypothesis test. Uh, looking at two variances. Um, this will give you some some example of what, what we're going to be working with. Okay. Um, actually, let me open up my F table quick while I'm just getting settled in. Uh, where is it? <laughs> you can see all the stuff that I have in here for you guys. F table. There we go. We're going to use this. So, if you're working on this at home, you're going to need this question that I have right here, as well as your F table. You can find those online. If you just Google F table, you should come up with something. Okay. So here's the question. Investors commonly use the standard deviation of the monthly percentage return for a mutual fund as a measure of the risk for the fund. In such cases, a fund that has a larger standard deviation is considered more risky than a fund with lower standard deviation. The standard deviation for the American Century Equity Growth Fund and the standard deviation for the Fidelity Growth Discovery Fund were recently reported to be 15% and 18.9% respectively. Assume that each of these standard deviations is based on a sample of 60 months of returns. Do the sample results support the conclusion that the Fidelity Fund has a larger population variance than the American Century Fund? That's going to be important. Which fund is more risky? Okay. So, now if you remember, for step one here, when we have two variances, um, we're going to need to choose, we're going to need to be careful about how we de de designate our populations. So whichever has the larger sample variance or sample standard deviation is population one. Remember, sample variance is S squared, sample standard deviation is S, so whichever one of those is bigger is, uh, is going to be population one. We do that, you'll see why we do that. We do that so that we can use our F table and it can be shorter. Okay, so let's pull from our question. We're going to need to find these. So the American Century Equity Growth Fund, it says, has a standard deviation of 15%. Right, That's right here. So I'm going to call that S sub ACEG. Those are supposed to be underneath. It's going to be 0 0.15. Um, and that's going to be less than 0 0.189, which is S uh, FGD. So that means that this is going to be population one. But because I'm going to need them eventually, because I'm going to need to use variances in my test statistic, I'm going to get the variances right now. Anyway, so let's just get these right now. S squared one is going to be SFGD squared, right? S squared FGD, because we've defined that as population one. It's going to be 0 0.189 squared which equals 0 0.035721. S2 squared is going to be S is going to be the other one, 0 0.15 squared. I'll save myself a little bit of writing there. It's going to give us 0 0.0225. Okay. Now you can see that not only is the standard deviation for population one bigger, that always is going to be the case that that means that the variance is going to be bigger. Fair enough. Okay. Now now that we've defined our populations, we can look at the question. Do the sample results support the conclusion that the Fidelity Fund, population one, has a larger population variance than the American Century Fund? So we want to know, does it support the conclusion, which means we have an alternative, that the Fidelity Fund, sigma one squared variance, is greater than the variance in the other one, in the American Century Fund? Um, and that's going to be our alternative. We're going to test that against the null that it's not the case that you know that actually the population variance is no greater. That's what this looks like. So th that's our hypothesis. Now here's a good time to check. If you've chosen your population correctly, this should always be an upper tail test or a two tail test. What kind of test is it? Well, it's an upper tail test. So huzzah! Kudos to us. We've done well so far. Okay. So step one takes a little while here, but we have it done. Step two is choose a level of significance. The question doesn't give us one. I'm going to use alpha equals 0 0.05. That's pretty standard. You can pick one. Um, that's what I'm going to use. Step three is to choose a test statistic. Well, we have two populations. We're dealing with variances. So our test statistic looks like this. F equals uh, S1 squared over S2. Two, 2 squared. Easy enough. It's just the ratio of sample variances 
Under the null, this is going to have a f distribution with n1 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the numerator and n2 minus 1 degrees of freedom in the denominator. Okay, so all we need here is, well, we're going to need our sample sizes in a second to find the distribution, but we just need those to calculate it. So I'm not going to rewrite them because we're running a little short on time. Not terrible. We're doing fine. Five minutes in. But step four, you know, switch colors again. Keep it nice and bright. F equals, it's going to be 0 0.035721. Notice I'm pulling my variances now, the ones I squared, over 0 0.0225. And just look at this, it's going to be 1.5-ish. If you plug this in, you should calculate it. It's 1.58 seven six that's what I got oh that's right I forgot about this okay this question the way that the book gives it asks us to use sample of 60 months of returns I'm gonna make an executive decision n1 n2 the way the question gives it 60 I'm gonna scrap that I'm gonna say pretend there's 61 the reason I'm gonna say that is that way when we subtract we get f 60 60 instead of f 5959. The reason we do that is because it's nice to have a nice round number. We don't actually have 5959 on our F table. Um, but that's the true distribution, right? The true distribution here because of the samples is going to be 5959. You can either fudge it here by changing your sample size, which is totally illegal, or you can fudge it here by changing your degrees of freedom, which is also totally illegal. Um, but for the purposes of understanding how to do this, it's fine. It's fine enough. So, I'll talk about what the effects of that are in a little bit. Okay, so step five, what do we need to do? Well, let's draw our curve. Okay, so we have an F distribution. Our value of F is, well, let's draw the curve. We got kind of a one hump shape, asymmetrical, always positive. F of 60 comma 60, and we have a test statistic of 1.588. That's fine. And because it's an upper tail test, what we want to know is what is the area under the curve to the right of our test statistic? This maroon area here. How do we find this? Well, we look on the, on the F table. Now, if you remember, F table has numerator degrees of freedom and denominator degrees of freedom. We have here is we have 60 degrees of freedom in the numerator, and you can see now if we had 59, we'd be somewhere in here. You probably would just want to say, I'm going to use 60 anyway because it's close. Um, and we're going to need to scroll down several pages. I think it's actually all the way on the last page here. It's a big table. But here's the curve we have. right? I wish I could just select those four, but I can't. Okay, so 60, 60 is this section right here. You can see four numbers, and they correspond to four areas in the upper tail. What we need to do is we need to put ours in here somewhere. Now, if you recall, if you have this written down yourself, ours was 1.59 or so. Um, and so it's going to fall between 1.53 and 1.67. Now we can see here that 1.67 has an area of 2.5% in the upper tail. 1.48 has an area of 5% in the upper tail. Ours is going to fall between those two. Right, so we had 1.48 here. The area to the right here, that's that's a one point that's a terrible 1.48, but that's what it is. The area to the right is 5%. And the other one was 1.67, which has an area to the right of 2.5%. And so our area falls between there. That's our p-value as well as our area. So 0 0.025 is less than our p-value is less than 0 0.05. That's what we can say. We can bound it just like we did with t's, just like we did with chi-squared. Uh, nuts. Okay. So that tells us something. We're in between here. Um, what do we conclude? Well, this is our alpha. That's what we decided. And because the probability we'd see something like this is less than alpha, we reject the null. We can conclude that um, the variance for the, whichever one is bigger, the Fidelity Growth Fund, the population variance is actually bigger. Reject H0. Because the population variance is bigger, we can also answer which fund is more risky. The one with a higher population variance, Fidelity Growth Discovery Fund, is riskier. Um, if we didn't reject the, the null, we have to say we can't tell which is riskier because we can't draw any conclusions. But as it, as it turns out, we can. Okay, now, I cheated here, remember? 
I mean, I mean, cheat, I made a simplifying assumption, whatever. So, what effect did that simplifying assumption have? Well, let me bust out Excel and I'll show you. Now, if you recall, it wouldn't, that assumption didn't change our test statistics, so let me show you what, what, it, what it did do. I'm going to find the p-value for our test statistic in both cases. So let's see. If uh, we used 59, 59 degrees of freedom, we would have gotten this. Equals f dist uh, 1.5876 with 59, 59. I don't remember if this gives us the upper tail. It does. So that would have given us a p-value of 0 0.039. Now, if we used 60, comma 60, what would we get? Well, I can Control D will copy this down. I'll just go in and I'll modify 60, comma 60, and you can see not, not that big a difference, right? So when we use 60, 60, we got a 3.8 percent chance p-value, right? p-value of 3.8 percent. Um, when we use 59, 59, if we'd done it right, we would have gotten 3.92. Now, on a table, we don't have as much access to information as we do in Excel. So if you feel comfortable using Excel, you definitely should. Um, but what, for many cases, it's handier to have a, just a table there if you're not at a computer. You don't have access to, the, to a computer. Or you don't have an app for your phone that allows you to do it. You can use a table and you can you know just make conservative guesses. Um, but there you go. So that's how you solve this kind of a problem. Um, our bounds are correct. We can see our, p -val our true p-value falls somewhere in those bounds. Even even though we did make a fudge, we did include a fudge factor. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me at jjdelaney at ualr.edu or uh, leave me a comment on this page, and I'll uh, do what I can to help. Thanks, guys. See you again soon.